I confess that the prospect of the department suffering such embarrassment, along with the rage of idealistic students and the justifiable indignation of the community of right-thinking people, weighed on my mind. Should it have? I'm not sure. The staff of the department certainly have a duty to protect the department's reputation, for on that depends in large measure its ability to function as a teaching institution. But this is a purely consequentialist argument, as we say in philosophical ethics. And I wonder whether it has any purchase except where there is a prior judgment uh, that there is, in fact, something wrong in the department's continuing to honor McEachran, a judgment that's not based, consequentially. Suppose that the danger of being the object of public outrage had been much greater and more imminent. Could it have been so great as to be sufficient on its own, regardless of whether it was right or wrong to continue the prize from a non-consequentialist standpoint as to justify bringing the prize to an end? Or would that have just been still another example of academic cowardice? I find myself undecided on the role that consequentialist considerations should have had in the decision. Certainly, we all considered the negative impact ending the prizes would have on our students and on our teaching program. But is such a consideration one which should figure in the deliberation only if non-consequentialist considerations do not settle the matter? Or can they become so large that they can, at least in principle, outweigh a judgment that, apart from consequentialist considerations, eliminating the prize is the right thing to do? Can the non-consequentialist considerations themselves be of varying weight so that some are more easily overruled by the consequentialist ones? But if we adopt that position, aren't we on the slippery slope which leads to pure opportunism? A strict utilitarian, of course, would argue that only consequentialist considerations should be in play. The debate should have been whether the threat of future public embarrassment and ridicule leading to the possible collapse of our teaching role was greater or less than the negative impact on our students and our program from not having these prizes to distribute. Given the uncertainty of the threat, the judgment on this matter would certainly not have been an easy one, even had these consequences been the only things to weigh. We all know that there is no science combining probability and a metric for benefits and detriments that is going to enable us to simply calculate our way to a decision in such a case. It's a judgment call, as we say. But I think most people, myself included, will say that the strict utilitarian approach is inadequate. We who supported the eventual decision wanted to say that apart from all consequences of what we decide to do, it just is wrong to honor a man who has done such things as he did. But what features of the situation make it wrong? Suppose it had been revealed that McEachran was a terrible womanizer, cheating on his long-suffering wife again and again. Would we have canceled the prizes for that reason? I don't think so. But womanizing can be a very obscene and contemptible way of behaving. What makes it different from the case of deliberately sterilizing people without any care in determining whether such sterilization was justified? Or worse, if it is worse, suppose it was revealed that he was a pedophile and had made trips to the brothels of Thailand. One difference here is that gross sexual misconduct is frequently a sign of mental sickness or of some sort. But measuring out one's contempt, <clears throat> before measuring out one's contempt, one wants to know the background. Was he mistreated in certain ways as a youth? Does he suffer from some genetic predisposition? 
But in the sterilization case, there seems to be no likelihood that anything like that, anything not um, uh, under the person's control was involved. There are no base passions at work, no primal urges that require repression. There is just a sort of negligent disregard for what people were entitled to. The judgment seems to have been made by the committee that since these people behave in ways which do not at all easily fit into our Alberta society or will be detrimental to society or to themselves, or at least what we would like to see Alberta society become, they and we are best off if they don't have any children. But then, isn't it just that McEachran and the other committee members were operating with a false ideology? the ideology of eugenics at that time. Other people that we continue to honor shared that ideology. Tommy Douglas and Emily Murphy spring to mind. It's just that McEachran got to put the ideology into practice, whereas Douglas and Murphy didn't. One might want to say that McEachran, being a learned man, should have known better than to fall for that nonsense. And I guess I would agree with that. But it's hardly sufficient justification for calling for an end to the prizes in his name. At that time, I thought that, yes, if all that were involved here was his operating in accord with the demands of a false ideology, which he actually thought was good science, then the case for eliminating the prizes was insufficient. But I reason, this isn't the whole story for McEachran and his committee actually overstepped their legal authority. They should have at least have kept their actions within the law of the land. It was this, I believe, which clinched the case by adding a whole extra dimension of disreputableness to the board's proceedings. Now I'm not so sure whether this makes a great deal of difference. Suppose McEachran and his committee were totally convinced by the eugenic pseudoscience that these sterilizations were in the best interest both of the victims and society, and they decided that this benefit outweighed their obligations to stay within the law. Then weigh that situation to one in which the law was such that they did not have to break it in order to proceed with the sterilizations. Is the action all that much less despicable in the latter case than in the former? The extermination camps run by the Nazis were in the law as the Nazis promulgated it. Would the proceedings have been much more despicable if they were not within the law? Would the persons that ordered them have been much more contemptible? There's also the consideration that even by the standards of the time, McEachran and the board were proceeding in an outrageous fashion that they had to break the law to do what they did is evidence of this. Suppose the reverse, that the standards of the time were totally in sympathy with their actions, much in the way that for centuries the southern United States was in sympathy with first slavery of black Africans and then later gross intimidation and discrimination. Does this make much difference in whether we should continue to honor the man 